Okay, so we are on session two of our eugenics Bible study. Uh, the title of today's topic is Modern Eugenics, New Label, Same Contents. So I'm using the imagery of a, a bottle of uh, liquid, alcohol, whatever, a beverage. And the idea is if you take the label off of that bottle and you put a new label on, well, the, there's a new label on the face but what's in the bottle hasn't changed. It's still the same uh, liquid contents in the bottle. And before we get into our um, study on modern eugenics, I do wanna have a little bit of an opening devotion from Galatians chapter four, talking about the well-born one. Eugenics meaning good birth or well-born. So who is the truly well-born one? Galatians chapter 4 says this, beginning at verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons of God, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And so I share this uh, because Jesus Christ is the one who came down from heaven and was born of the Virgin Mary, as we confess in the Apostles' Creed. And interestingly, uh, we talked last week about where this term eugenics is actually found in the Bible. You know, eugenics being a Greek Uh, term can be found in the Bible that was in the New Testament, especially that was written in Greek. So interestingly, uh, Jesus in the parable of the ten minas, this is from Luke chapter 19, Jesus is giving a parable about the kingdom of heaven. And in this parable, a a nobleman, uh, the Greek there for nobleman is eugenes, and, and literally translated, that is the eugenic one, the eugenic guy or the well-born one, a nobleman goes to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. And so Jesus is the one who, who comes to a far country. That is, he comes to our world and then he dies and rises for us again. And then he goes, he ascends back to the Father to receive the kingdom of God so that he can share it with us. But the reason that he can receive that is because he is the eugenic one. He is the truly well-born one. Jesus Christ, we say, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And uh, we see that the well-born one was born in Bethlehem, uh, that the Gospels tell us, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And the reason that we can be adopted into God's family, into God's kingdom, is because Jesus Christ truly had a good birth, a eugenic birth. He is the only one in all of humanity since Adam's fall into sin that had a good birth. And by virtue of his birth, we can be born again. We can be adopted into God's family. It is, it is through the good birth of Jesus that we ourselves can have a good birth, uh, the birth that is from above of water and the Spirit, and holy baptism. So we give thanks and praise to God that there is truly one who had a eugenic birth, who had that good birth, Jesus Christ, so that we also can be sons of God, adopted into God's family through Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, that's kind of an interesting recap of where uh, eugenics is found in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the eugenic one, Uh, We are not, no matter how good or strong or able or fit you are, um, you do not have a good birth unless you are born again in Jesus Christ. Okay, so in today's uh, study, I want to launch into this question about where did the eugenics movement go? And as I indicate, uh, the eugenics movement that we talked about from the late 1800s and the early 1900s, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Uh, Rather, 
it has just changed its label. In other words, it's still the same contents in the bottle. The bottle just has a new label. Last week, we went over what is, what is the definition of eugenics. And, and this definition actually comes from Francis Galton, who is the inventor of eugenics. And later in his life, uh, he said that this is the official definition of eugenics and, and other eugenic organizations, like the, the main eugenic organizations agreed, and they adopted it as their official definition. Okay, so eugenics is the study of agencies under social control, that usually means political power, that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. Okay, so this is the whole idea that you can use um, uh, things like government, personal choice, all these things to, to drive human evolution to improve the quality of future generations. And here when they say racial qualities, that's, they're really referring to genetic qualities. It's not what we think of as race today necessarily, but it's more genetic. And again, there's this idea of improving future generations, but also preventing uh, the, the deterioration of future generations. So improving would be the positive eugenics, whereas um, preventing um, the deterioration of future generations would be the negative uh, eugenics. So positive, you promote superior qualities in uh, man, and negative eugenics discourages the inferior qualities in man. So, you know, eugenics is this whole idea of, you know, can we, um, you know, by, you know, influencing uh, society, agencies under social control, can we improve the human race? Can we improve human evolution? And in fact, uh, here's a, a poster for um, one of these uh, eugenic organization meetings from 1921, the International Exhi Exhibition of Eugenics. They said eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So they explicitly connect eugenic thinking to Darwinian ideas of evolution. So evolution is considered like Darwin's ideas. So when you're using the term evolutionary, that's assuming that... Darwinian evolution, yeah. Okay. Yeah, certainly at, in, in 1921, um, it would have been, you know, what Darwin was, was thinking for, what, he, what Darwin meant when he said evolution in 1921, that's, you know, before uh, more advanced uh, research had been done in genetics. So um, this would be, you know, the, the understanding of evolution by natural selection, which is Darwinian evolution. Now, um, So we, there we have this definition of eugenics. So you can ask yourselves, uh, did eugenics go away? Or where did it go? I mean, is this something that only existed leading up to World War II, and then it was um, you know, kind of co-opted by the Nazis and, and used for eugenic excesses like concentration camps and lethal chambers and the extermination of the unfit, and then after World War II, eugenics goes away. That is kind of um, the mainstream narrative of the history of eugenics, is that it gained steam through the 1920s and 30s up to World War II, and then World War II happens, and everyone realizes what the Nazis did, and so it gives a sour taste in our mouth about eugenics, and so eugenics goes away after World War II. But this is not so, and we will see this based on even this definition of eugenics. All right, so um, <clears throat> most people uh, have not heard of the term eugenics before. So you can ask, you know, how often does this term get used? And uh, in fact, this is a result from the Google search engine for the term eugenics and its usage over time. And you can see uh, beginning in the 1900s, early 1900s, there's the, the usage of the term eugenics. Welcome, Alan. 
<clears throat> the usage of the term eugenics, it begins to increase in frequency. So 1883 is when Francis Galton in England uh, coins the term eugenics and, and founds the, the study of eugenics. His ideas spread and catch on in popularity, and by the early 1900s, you can start to see that eugenics starts to be a commonly used term in the English language. <clears throat> and somewhere in the 1920s and the 1930s, um, eugenics reaches a peak, okay, in terms of its usage and its popularity in the English language. And then, but you can see there's this, this remarkable, remarkable decline after, well, the 1940s, World War II era. There's this decline in the use of the term eugenics from the 1950s onward. But now in the modern era, era 2010 and on, uh, you can see that there's, there's an increase in the usage of eugenics, and um, that's because um, eugenics has been uh, the subject of more historical investigation lately, and so now people are starting to look into it a little more. But based on this graph, you could say, yeah, it's plausible that eugenic thinking went away after World War II. You know, after all, uh, it kind of fell off of the usage map here, and uh, people just weren't talking about it as much. But go ahead. So the, the term eugenics, this is the term eugenics, it's the measurement of its usage. So it would appear, based on this uh, usage chart, that eugenics faded in, in popularity after World War II, and that's kind of what the standard histories of eugenics say, is that you know, it, it was picking up steam, leading to World War II. World War II put a sour taste in our mouth. Now we're going to distance ourselves from eugenics, and we're not going to practice it anymore. Well, the, the, basically, right here, 1883, is when eugenics comes on the scene. The, the whole idea of eugenics is invented by Francis Galton in 1883. So it takes a while for the idea to spread. It's not, not like in 1883, all of a sudden, everyone knows what it is. But by the early 1900s, and this is when a lot of the first eugenics societies and eugenics journals and eugenics laws start to be passed and start to form. So this is when, you know, eugenics really hits the public scene. But <clears throat> what I am um, getting at here with this slide is that it does seem plausible that after World War II, eugenics kind of falls off the radar, doesn't it? I mean, certainly from its high water mark in the 1930s, before World War II. Yes, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. After the revelation of the Nazis in the concentration camps, the historical um, kind of narrative that is mainstream says, because of the shocking abu abuses and atrocities of the Nazis, eugenics, the idea of eugenics declines that we should be, the idea that we should be eliminating the unfit from our population and it's promoting the superior, you know, for, for Hitler, the superior was the Aryans, right? The Aryan race, blonde hair, blue eyed, all this, all this stuff. It wasn't that for every eugenicist. I mean, eugenics had a broad kind of understanding and, and different people understood it different ways. So maybe for you, the superior looked a little different than the Aryan race. Certainly for the Nazis, it was the Aryans that were held up as the, the fit superior class of humanity. Yeah, Alan. You can see that in like 2000, it starts to go the other way with the research and development and uh, what do they call that work? They breed embryos and they breed sperm and they can hold that forever and they can have it grown in another person other than the mother and the father, plus the, 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 tra the understanding of the genes, being able to take the gene apart. Mm -hmm. It was just a show on, and they were talking about kicking these bad genes out of people's uh, genome 
and replace him with something else in order to make this perfect child. And you can pick what kind of child you want to have by removing the Alzheimer's gene that you might have or the cancer gene that she might have. Now it all makes sense to me. Because they were talking about eugenics in that program. Yeah, yeah, and you hit the nail on the head, Alan, I think. We're going to kind of talk about where the eugenics movement has gone. And um, so you, you ran ahead of my presentation a little bit, but I, I think you're right that eugenics has, has primarily moved from the realm of state coercive power. I mean, eugenics before World War II, um, they were openly talking about forcibly sterilizing people. We talked about that last week, and they did that. 1927 Buck versus Bell Supreme Court case said that sterilizing people forcibly was legal according to our Constitution. That Supreme Court case has never been overturned. And uh, I mentioned how that Supreme Court case was cited as one of the Supreme Court cases that was cited in the Roe versus Wade decision to justify abortion. You know, we can forcibly sterilize people so we can also abort them. But uh, no, I, I think that eugenics has moved. What, what you bring up here about gene editing and designer babies and all, all that stuff, uh, that is eugenics as well, but we'll kind of get into that. Now, the emphasis of the social control has shifted from the government to individual personal choice, right? So it's, it's the parents going to the fertility clinics and such like things like that. So it's not necessarily the government mandating that you have to do this, but nonetheless, uh, according to the definition of eugenics, you're still trying to improve the quality of future generations, the racial quality or the genetic quality of future generations physically or mentally through all of these things. So yeah, I, I agree, and uh, we'll, we'll actually spend... Uh, the next Bible study, talking more exactly about the, the topics you raise, Alan. But I want to um, talk a little bit more in this study about why it is that there's a seeming drop-off in interest in eugenics when there was all this steam built up before World War II, and all of a sudden after World War II it just disappears. Now, what I'm going to try and demonstrate is that was by design. The chief leading eugenicist said that they wanted to um, engage in a political relations campaign or a public relations campaign to change the face of eugenics. Okay? So why, why don't we know? Maybe you heard about eugenics before this. Some people have. But honestly, if you've heard about eugenics before this Bible study, you know, certainly 20 years ago, if you knew about eugenics 20 years ago, you know, before... Um, before this little uptick right here around the early uh, 2000s, if you knew about eugenics then, you were in the minority, okay? You, that was by design. We were not taught about eugenics, and this is empirically so. So um, this is a, actually a very recent article in the Independent Review, summer 2020, that came out by uh, economics professor Thomas Cargill, the University of Nevada at Reno. He says this about teaching eugenics. I have covered eugenics and related topics in my lectures on the history of economic ideas for many years and have been surprised at two reactions from students. First, many students find eugenics and related topics the most interesting part of the course. And second, with only a few exceptions, the students have never heard of eugenics in the United States and especially its relationship to Nazi Germany. So Thomas Cargill in his economics class, he, cover, he talks about this idea about eugenics because remember eugenics, they targeted the economically poor. All right, so this, economics was involved in the whole idea and the whole enterprise of eugenics. So Thomas Cargill in his, he's an emeritus professor now, so in his long career of teaching, he says that most of his college-educated students had never heard of eugenics. 
And that was certainly my case. I had never heard of eugenics before going to college. Um, so uh, Cargill, Professor Cargill, surveyed nine mainstream US history textbooks. He studied them for what they said and what they taught about eugenics in mainstream you know, public school history textbooks that are published by uh, Pearson, um, uh, McGraw-Hill, Houghton Mifflin, I think, is the other one. Um, these are some of the main textbook publishers for our schools in, in U.S. history. And nine mainstream, these are some of the, the main ones that, use, that history teachers use to teach U.S. history. Five of the nine did not even mention eugenics anywhere in the text of the textbook. And the other four of, of the nine that did mention it gave only scant or very minimal attention to, the, to eugenics. And none, none of the nine textbooks, zero, even mentioned the Supreme Court case Buck versus Bell, which is one of the most discriminatory um, Supreme Court case rulings in our nation's history. And Cargill says that this is especially noteworthy because um, most every U.S. history textbook gives much attention to the Dred Scott versus Sanford Supreme Court case, which ruled that slaves, uh, slaves were not uh, human persons, so they could be counted as um, property. Right? One of the most, this is one of the other most discriminatory um, Supreme Court cases in U.S. history. So they, they, they're careful to mention this and its contribution to racism, its contribution to slavery, its contribution to the Civil War, but no mention of Buck versus Bell in, in the history of forced sterilization. So if you have never heard of eugenics before this Bible study, or before recently, well, that's, I would argue, that's by design. The, our our um, textbooks, are not, our history classes are not teaching us about it. And why is that? Why is that? That we're not learning about this, certainly not in high school. You might touch on it in a college course. Alan. Is it the fact that they didn't want to be associated with Germany or its, its uh, association with eugenics? Well, yeah, it's certainly a blemish on our historical life together that this whole enterprise of eugenics and forced sterilization and segregation, institutionalization, it's certainly a blemish on our history, but so is slavery, okay? The problem is, is that most of the, the people who are involved in these, writing these textbooks, they're the, metaphorically speaking, they're the children and grandchildren of these eugenicists. The people who supported and pushed through these eugenic laws, they're looked up to by much of mainstream public education today. They're looked up to as role models of the progressive movement. And so this kind of tarnishes, it's something that tarnishes their record. So it's just kind of conveniently swept underneath the rug. And I can say anecdotally, at least, I never, ever heard about eugenics. If I did, I don't remember, but I never heard or was formally taught about eugenics until uh, college is when I first discovered it. My kids weren't either. I can't remember either one of them ever seeing or saying anything about learning about it. Evan may have run across it when he, you know, goes on the weekend website and listens to, you know, the different pastors on there. I think he ran across it in there. I'm not sure, though. Yep, and, and this is by design. Okay, well, I can't necessarily speak to the modern textbook writers and, and why they omitted it. I, you know, we have our hunches, and, and Cargill, you know, submits his that it's mainly because um, the, the heroes of the progressive movement, many of them are implicated in this whole eugenic enterprise. And so, again, it's just swept underneath the rug, and if you go through your general high school U.S. history course, you'll come away with very little to no knowledge or information on the eugenics movement, though it was a, a huge part. It was, I mean, it affected 
federal legislation on immigration and forced sterilization, federal policy, state policy, I mean, it was a huge part of our history, the coercive era of eugenics. Now, like I said, this is by design. The eugenic bottle label change after World War II um, eugenics faced a public relations problem. Leading up to, but especially after World War II, um, there were many critics of eugenic theory, eugenic practice. And really, this was largely due to the fact that essentially what the eugenicists were saying was that, you know, maybe the top 10% of the population, maybe the, even only the top 3% of the population should be allowed to procreate and pass on their superior genes to the succeeding generations to, again, to drive human evolution to a superior stage. And so, really, when you think about it, what they're saying is most people are unworthy, are unfit to procreate. And they're diluting the human gene pool. And so when that's your message, you know, you're going to, you're going to, infuriate a lot of people, right? Most of you are unfit, is essentially what the eugenic message was. So that's not going to be a very popular message. And then, of course, with the revelation of Nazi World War II era atrocities and, and, and eugenics conflation with all of that, um, eugenics had this public relations problem. And so there was this whole idea among eugenic circles that to promote the more controversial aspects of eugenics, this should be outsourced to other professions. The eugenicists should not be in charge of promoting their own philosophy, their own theory, their own pra eugenic practice. The, eugenics were not the eugenicists were not responsible for it, or they should not be, but other professions should take on the mantle of eugenics, just under a different name, especially they focused on the medical profession right, because we're, we're dealing in the re realm of medical practice, medical ethics with eugenics. Now, I, I, last uh, session I talked about the American Eugenics Society. The British, eugen the British had a counterpart to the American Eugenics Society. The, they had the British Eugenics Society, okay? So in 1957, um, one of the leading members of the British Eugenics Society, C.P. Blacker, he encouraged the British Eugenics Society to practice crypto-eugenics. And that's what he called it, crypto or hidden, right? Uh, crypto meaning, the root meaning like to hide, so hidden eugenics. Crypto-eugenics, pursuing eugenic ends by less obvious means. That's what he encouraged the British Eugenic Society to do. Frederick Osborne, who was, uh, at one time, he was the president of the American Eugenic Society. Uh, Frederick Osborne said, in one of his books, eugenic goals are most likely to be attained under a name other than eugenics. So especially following World War II, we have the eugenic leaders themselves telling us in their mainstream publications, you know, this is, um, this is, these are the books that they're publishing, these are their conference papers that they're presenting. They, they're telling us that they are going to pursue eugenic aims through other means, or as uh, uh, C.P. Blacker says, crypto-eugenics. And so we see, like I said, this public relations campaign where eugenic organizations change their names. So the American Eugenic Society, they take, they take their leader's advice and in 1973 change their name to the Society for the Study of Social Biology. The Society for the Study of Social Biology. And in their uh, academic journal, after this name change takes place, they say in, in the vo first volume of the journal, the change of name of the society does not, does not coincide with any change of its interests or policies. So they change their name, but they're still pursuing eugenic goals or eugenic ends. And actually, they changed their name again since then. They're now called the Society. It's the, the American Eugenic Society still exists today. It's just called the Society for Biodemography and Social Biology. So it has completely abandoned, a eugenic society has completely abandoned 
the term eugenics. And of course, their journal, which was called the Eugenics Quarterly, also changed its name to Social Biology in 1968. And today, again, the name change changed to Biodeg uh, Biodemography and Social Biology. Okay? But you can see these name changes for public relations purposes. Uh, likewise, the British Eugenics Society in 1967 did something very similar, changed to the Galton Society. And as journal, the Eugenics Review, it changed in 1969 to the Journal of Biological Science. So we have this crypto-eugenics going on where the eugenicists are pursuing eugenic goals under other names and in other professions, and they're not, being, they're not calling themselves explicitly uh, the eugenics movement or eugenicists anymore after uh, World War II. So the fact that you haven't heard that eugenics has just not been part of the public consciousness is by design. The eugenicists themselves transformed their institutions, their names, and their strategy for pursuing eugenic goals. They transformed it to be pursued uh, uh, secretly under other um, agendas. Okay, and I'll end with this. So... Um, this is a, a summary of eugenic history by Philippe Levine, um, a professor, I believe, in Texas. And after uh, studying kind of uh, the eugenics movement from its beginnings to today, she says this at the end of her book, it is safe to say that eugenics did not disappear after World War II. Most striking, perhaps, in modern eugenic practice is the emphasis on individual choice and consumer preference. So it's just what you were bringing up, Alan. It's what individuals choose to do with their, the pursuit of their own children. She goes on to say, we would do well to remember the human cost of so many earlier eugenic practices and the uncanny tendency of that burden to fall heavily on the shoulders of those who could least afford to fight it. And there, of course, she's referring to um, people like Carrie Buck in the infamous Buck versus Bell. Carrie Buck didn't have the legal means to defend herself against forced sterilization. Neither did her family. So it is the people who can least afford to fight eugenic policy and eugenic practice who, are, who bear the heaviest burden of eugenic thinking. And, and uh, Professor Levine says, uh, she asserts that eugenics did not disappear after World War II, okay? It just shifted from this, the whole idea that the government should coercively um, push through eugenic practice and eugenic policy, and, and that the responsibility for eugenic belief and practice has been moved to individuals. Right, so instead of a top-down approach, it's more of a bottom-up approach to eugenics. Yeah, any thoughts or questions? Is it possible to get copies of those last two slides? Yeah, I can share this. Uh, well, and plus I'm going to post this online too. So this will be on our YouTube channel eventually. And uh, we're, we'll cover um, more next week. We'll... we'll probably spend two more weeks on this, and uh, we'll do more of a biblical response to eugenic thinking as well as part of the Bible study, but um, this is really just covering the historical groundwork. And again, um, I, I would just say uh, one note in closing, that you see the need for a um, kind of a, a reevaluation of the eugenics movement. So far, uh, most of the history of eugenics has either been you know, swept under the rug like we saw with those U.S. history textbooks, or um, a lot of the kind of treatments of eugenics are very favorable, and they, they treat it with kind of a very um, charitable hand, you know, and, and, and they try to paint the eugenicists as these kind, charitable people, but they're just trampling on, on basic human rights, you know, and, and treating, treating people as inferior, uh, so much inferior garbage to be tossed aside. And so there's a great need um, 
this is just a general kind of commentary. There's a great need for Christians to be um, investigating these things, writing about them, and influencing public opinion. Right? You can do great work um, for Christ and his church and for all people outside of the church. Right? There's, there's these people who are being kind of, uh, like I said, crushed underneath the wheels of injustice, but we don't even know about it because we don't talk about it and we don't know about it. So there's, there's a need for intelligent Christian minds to get involved in this whole area of eugenics and to write the histories and to um, bring attention to this that it needs and deserves. Largely so that we can defend those who are least able to defend themselves. But eugenics, as we're beginning to see, eugenics has not gone away, has simply transformed its public persona, its public appearance, so that it can be more easily, more tolerably swallowed by the public. Okay? So that's where I will um, end today, uh, as we need to get going for church here in a couple of minutes. What's the name of that court case? Buck versus... Buck versus Bell. Yep. <laughs>